The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. This podcast series is brought to you by leading Australian life insurer, TAL. TAL is committed to partnering with advisors to protect the financial well-being of their clients now and into the future. TAL's accelerated protection products ensure your clients have access to cover options that are suited to their individual needs. Last financial year, TAL paid $2.7 billion in claims to nearly 40,000 customers. Hello, welcome. Thank you for tuning in for another episode of the Ensemble Podcast. I'm James Wrigley. I'm joined by Lucian Russ today from EMU Wealth. Lucian, thank you for joining me. Yeah, it's great to be with you, James. Thanks for uh, thanks for agreeing to be one of my one of my first guests on the podcast. I'm a little bit nervous to kind of taking over from from Ben. He, he's been doing it for for such a long period of time. So uh, yeah, you said to me to be gentle on you. You be you be gentle on me as we. Yeah, as we, have we, a chat can this get, we can all be nervous together, Tang, so I'm a bit nervous <laughs> too. So, <laughs> so if, if, Emu Wealth, tell me, that's an interesting name. Where, where does Emu Wealth come from? It was just a good, strong name. It's so hard when you're choosing a name and you've got to have one that, you know, you've got the domains and all the rest of it. And, you know, you think you're going to have forever to choose a name. And what happens is we ring you up and says, we need that name now because we've got to get the licensing done and we've got to do this and we've got to do that. So it's just, yeah, I just, I think it's growing on me. I was not sure at the start. But yeah, I just like it's Australian, it's strong. It's, at least people remember it. Yeah, nice, nice. Now, I've known you for a, for a little while now, Lucian. We kind of originally crossed paths with, uh, we're doing some stuff with Baz and the social advisor many years ago. But for for people that don't know you, can you maybe Talk us through your, your journey in financial advice. I know you've owned a business before, you've sold it, you spent a bit of time out of being in, being a financial advisor and now obviously more recently back into it. But what's your what's your journey like in financial advice? Yeah, so I started off in, in London, UK, 96, 97. I think I wanted to be a financial advisor, wanted to help people with you know money that's important to everybody but at that time the industry particularly in london was very kind of sales related so i joined the very swanky outfit in the west end of london but it was essentially quite a sales organization commission only you know uh, cold calling four hours a day um there was 800 people on this floor in london can you imagine it 800, 800 people. people i know i know it's massive um yeah you know, so after a little while, I thought, okay, I'm enjoying helping people, but not the sort of sales culture. So, you know, doing the, another couple of firms ended up being the sort of pensions expert at a firm in in the city of London. Um, we did a lot of, you know, our net worth clients and pension transfers from the old sort of DB schemes and even had to remify as the person in charge of rem- rem- doing the remediation, I can spit it out, for defined benefit transfers, you know, that were in poor advice. Um, so it was sort of like a sort of a baptism of the fire my first sort of few years in the industry. Yeah, um, right. So anyway, cut, cut a long story short, came to, well, 2005, wanted to, you know, if you were, we will have these sort of things, I didn't want to leave my bucket list to like, to the other end of life. So we took two years out, we traveled the world for two years, you know, went everywhere, did everything, had an amazing time, um, and then spent three years in South Africa running a not-for-profit um, yeah. enterprise skills-based charity in, in Cape Town, which was which was amazing. Um, and then 2009, came back to Australia. I was married to an Australian. My wife's Australian. We had one small child, so came back to Australia 2009. Um, so I had CFB and, you know, every single complex, you know, equivalent the exam in UK, like SMSS specialist, that sort of thing. But here I had to do all my exams again, which you know, probably good. 
But then, yeah, literally nobody would give me a job <laughs> in Australia. Really? But eventually, yeah, like nobody, because you don't have local experience. So even yeah, though you're like from London and England, it makes it easier, but you still that local experience. Um, but eventually, Commonwealth Bank gave me a job in the business financial planning. So after if Tony Monaco is watching, a big shout out to Tony Monaco. Um, he, you know, put some faith and trust in me, and uh, gave me my first, you know, job in Australia. Um, was there for eighteen months or so. Wanted to have my own show essentially, so went to AMP. Um, eventually bought two practices, one in Adelaide, one in Alice Springs, and sort of stitched them together. Um, so we had about sort of eight to eight full-time staff equivalent, that sort of thing. Did an over about 1.5, 1.6, something like that. Um, and, excuse me, wasn't really enjoying it. Um, you know, everything was going well. But then, um, you know, A&P got hit with all the things that we know. They, you know, had a, quite a big business loan with them, large practice, but big business loan and uh, their valuation shifting really meant that my practice was worth, you know, just a bit more. I lost about 50% a bit more. Yeah, right. About the same as the loan, essentially. Um, and we're talking, you know, a few million dollars here. So I got an option to sort of get out, which sort of had to, felt like I had to take from family's perspective, but um, yeah. didn't want it particularly. Um, and then I had a three-year uh, bowler, essentially, so was out the industry for three years. So, you know, it's quite a tough. Yeah, anybody's gone through that whole process, yeah. even when it goes well, it's a tough process to go through. Yeah. Can you talk a bit more about that? That, you know, like for, you know, for anyone that's new, like some of the young guys that work here and in, in our business, they won't be familiar at all with what, what people went through with some of what was happening with AMP. So were you one of the ones that, you know, you hear some stories that it was some people, that, you know, were fighting to try and get out in the first place. Did you manage to get out of it reasonably easily? Like, how, how difficult was it for you? Yeah, well, it's a good question. I look, I don't know, I don't want to say too much on the whole AMP yeah. situation because I don't want to have legal situation yeah, in any way. That's bad. Essentially, because I'd bought an existing practice, I'd actually bought the shares of the company rather than the book. So okay. plus is a minus. The one plus I had was I had an option to, to get out, really, with um, nearly all of my money. Yep. Which was good because we took on a big loan and we'd worked really, really hard over, you know, six, seven years to build it up and to transform that business from, you know, most AMP and most advisors have been through this from any commission based practice to a fee for service um based practice. And that's that's quite a big job as as a lot of people have gone through and know, you know, articulating, you know, value and fees. So I, I got out and I was quite lucky, but a lot yep. of people obviously had you know, challenges that were, you know, well documented and, you know, I still, you know, um, still got myself as lucky to have gotten out of that point and I know a lot of advisors' mental health suffered seriously, you know, and obviously reports of suicides and things like that. So I think it was yeah. a real tough spot because yeah. a lot of people have been in there for such a long time and had taken loans and they were guaranteed on the houses and their wives and to sort of come home you know, for anybody and explain, you know, my business isn't worth what I said it was worth, that we would be all right, we're not going to be all right, and we've got these huge challenges, um, you know, all things that go with that debt. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I'll probably let them say more than no, that. No, that's fair enough. Yeah. So, so, was that, so great you, you lived in my NNP, so I really, you know, felt, you know, f for people. And so you lived in, you lived in Alice Springs for a while. Um, was that yeah, we had so seven years had, in Alice Springs, so maybe that's so had, why we got with the emus as well. Yeah. So you had, so was it the business that you bought? Was it split across Adelaide and and Alice Springs, or it was two separate businesses you bought? We two separate businesses. So originally yep. we had practice in Adelaide and bought the practice in Alice Springs. My wife's from Alice Springs, her dad's from Alice Springs. Yeah, right. Okay, we had quite a good connection. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the idea was really to live in Adelaide, you know, because we live by the beach, have this perfect life, really, and travel back to Alice Springs. But we ended up, after a couple of years, so doing the opposite, living in Alice Springs and traveling back to Adelaide. So we had a team and we had advisors in Adelaide. So I lived in Alice Springs, and that was really good because my kids were young. So when I was there, I was, you know, could drop them off at school, five minutes to the office, 
pick them up during the school day if there was some drama or disaster or go to sports day. Um, pick up, used to pick them up from school as well and bring them to the office because there wasn't any childcare in Island Springs. Um, and the good thing was, even though I was away, you know, one week in fall, sometimes two weeks in fall, um, when I was there, I could see a lot of the kids and do a lot of the running around. So my wife was working, she had a big corporate job working full yeah. time. So, so it worked quite well being based in Alice Springs, then coming back to Adelaide and seeing key clients and just being in touch with the staff. Yeah, fantastic. That sounds great. Sounds fantastic. And so you got out of that and then you spent three years kind of out of advice for a while. Like what were you, what were you doing at, over that three year period? Yes, yeah, so obviously I was involved with Bowers Gardner, the social advisor for, for part of that period. Um, and just, yeah, just doing bits and pieces, consulting. I was living in Alice Springs, so we had a, you know, nice house, great life. My wife was working full time, you know, if we, we had money. So it was sort of fortunate from that perspective. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, gone into some board work. So I'm the chair of a disability um, services provider in Arnold Springs. Um, and I was on a clean water charity board um, and like coaching the soccer team and doing the, um, yeah, the school council and stuff. So a lot, a lot, a lot of great stuff I was in, involved with. So, um, yeah, and I sort of enjoyed that, but I did ultimately did find the sort of the one off consulting to be not as satisfying as when you get to work with clients, um, you know, in a deep way, like most financial planners obviously do in our place sort of enduring relationship. Like, I missed that. I wanted to get back into that. Um, and also with the consulting side, you're often finding that you're sort of chasing clients the whole time and there's a, a fixed engagement and then you sort of need to, you know, chase the next client and chase the next yeah, client. Yeah. With. Yeah, wasn't the bit of the job only Yeah, and so now Emu Wealth, what's it like setting up a business from scratch in the in the current environment? You, know, you, you land, speak to some people and they say it's really tough as a sole practitioner to to try and do it on your own. You need some form of scale or or, or support. Like what? How, sure. how do you start? You know, we've got a blank yeah. piece of paper. How do you start a business from scratch in financial advice? Yeah, no, look, I think there's probably, and I was just thinking about this on the on the on the car this morning. There's there's probably two ways to do it. There's sort of a legacy way to do it, where you've got some sort of legacy from legacy clients or a client list or following, and then you're sort of, you know, doing what you used to do, maybe with some improvements. And that's probably the the smarter, easy way to do it, to be honest, because you've got revenue <laughs> from day one. Yep. And then there's probably the other way of doing it, which is the path I went down, which is not necessarily the best way to do it, but where you want to create something new, you want to do something different. Um, you don't have that sort of legacy book sort of, you know, ways of doing things holding you back, but you don't have those revenue streams or clients yet either, and you just want to do something new, fresh, different. And that, yeah, and that's definitely... Yeah, tough journey. I'd probably would do most things completely differently if I had my time again. Peter. Um but I think at the same time, you know, it's it's it's, it's a journey you don't go on because it's easy or quick or simple. I think it's a journey you go on because you sort of believe in advice yeah. fundamentally and you believe in helping people and you believe it should be done a certain way and you, you want to uphold those values which some people can do with big corporates and other practices. Some people find that it's more difficult to, to try and do it sort of there or great. Yeah. So who are you? Who are you working with now? Like who? Who? Who's the typical in your wealth client? Um, so we're still very much a micro business. So look, I've had been lucky enough to have lots of great mentors in my career, like sort of Bill Backrack, Baz Gardner, Jim Stackpole, people like that recently. Um, and really, I think one of these key things is: can you grow a designed for wealth business? Um, without going through the activity phase, you know, activity phase is classically obviously when you sort of just take on most clients, get the activity up, you know, get get the cash flow going. Or can you uh, focus on just the ideal clients you want from the start? So that was my sort of key thing. I wanted to focus on sort of ideal clients from the start. There's always a challenge and a benefit. The problem with taking on too much activities, as we all know, we can fall into an activity trap where you just end up with a load of lower value clients. You can't sort of make money from long term and, you know, stuck in that activity zone. Whereas the flip side of that, if you're just trying to take on 
um, ideal clients for whatever you're trying to build, then um, the, it, that's more difficult because that it's longer takes more to find those clients, okay. and you you know, haven't got the cash flow coming in. So, so at the moment, we're probably fifty fifty of taking on some clients we love working with. Um, you know, maybe like a three four grand sort of minimum to get them in the door, um, and to you know, and to do a really good job for them and and do it effectively. Um, but also, yeah, targeting clients in that sort of six to twenty grand range, where we've got more complexity, we've got more comprehensive advice, and where you know that sort of traditional trusted advisor uh, model or principal advisor, whatever you want to call it, where you're really sort of digging deep and providing that sort of holistic advice. Yeah, have you have you mapped out what that what what your ideal engagement looks like for that? Mentioned someone that's going to pay you somewhere between six and twenty thousand dollars. It's not a small fee. What have you mapped out? Like in, in your mind, you know, if, if this ideal client walks through the door, what that journey is that you're taking them on, what that looks like. Yeah, and no, I, I think there's a few things that the you know a client needs to want and appreciate. I think to get any client, but particularly an ideal client. So I think ultimately you know as most of us know they've got to be somebody that you know wants advice and wants to have a relationship you know if you sort of break it down what what are we providing it's really a relationship at the end of the day um so that somebody feels like we're in their corner we're sort of batting for them we haven't got any conflicts from got any distractions and that we're just talking about things that are not you know just product and structure and all these things we're talking about you know what's their values what's their goals you know those sorts of things so um so i think definitely looking for sort of com- some good goals somebody who's in a reasonably good financial position and somebody that's got some complexity now that complexity could be technical but it could be as simple as you know bad spending habits or you know a couple that can't agree on what their direction of travel should be and i think that whole concept of you know drilling into you know what is really really important what the clients value what they're stuck on and sort of just taking that from a holistic you know perspective and just listening for what are they really trying to achieve from day one rather than just diving into okay well it all sounds great let's look at your secret investments and all that sort of stuff it's really what maybe for a client it's I don't know, fixing their spending habits, you know, or getting their estate plan sorted out, all their tax returns up to date. So it's just really listening, well, what is the main pain point that we got to solve before we can get them thinking, you know, long term, engage that deeper part of their sort of thinking and brain and really start building, you know, a, a vision of the future that they can, you know, both agree on. Um, yeah. So I don't know, too vague or broad, James, but that's kind of how I think that's fine. I notice you put, you put a post up on LinkedIn, and it might have been in the last week or so. It was this it was this cartoon of like a garage? Someone opened up the garage door, and you know, yeah. with this this joke of "Oh, this will all be yours soon, son," or something like that. It was was you know it was this idea of you know you can eat, someone's going to inherit all of this rubbish from from their from their their parents. I know in some of the interactions we've had, and with 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 Baz, you know, he he spoke or you spoke, someone did, and it kind of stuck with me this idea of. That we, you know, typically as financial advisors, you know, the clients will come into the office or we talk to them online or whatever, and and it's really we're not kind of going into their space, we're not really going into their world, and this idea of charging some type of fee or as part of the advice project, like actually going into their home and helping them clean up their storage and their filing system and and those kind of things, and perhaps that's part of their life that's overwhelming. Have have you have you gotten you know? that deep in the any client relationships yet or is that where you that's what you're you know you, you're thinking you'll you'll look to do for the right clients um look i think that's a metaphor i think it's a it's a powerful one for me because you know yeah. that idea of the swedish death cleaning where not when you're about to die but when you're sort of retired or in that active phase of retirement you sort of clear out you know psychologically physically you know often people are downsizing or so just sort of clearing out and clearing the decks and just working out what's kind of important. So I think for me, that's more of a metaphor. That could be, you know, mental things getting in the way. But I think what I learned from, you know, Bill Bacharax and the Bath Gardeners and the Jim Staffords and Carl Richards and all these people is that 
there's normally something that's difficult to fix because of some sort of emotional connection or problem, you know, whether it's shares that they inherited from their dad. So it doesn't have to be physical stuff um, or spending habits because of the, you know, their, their childhood. That's what, you know, they were taught. Or, you know, we've all met them. People are great at budgeting but, but not investing, you know. So it's just kind of trying to work out what's actually holding somebody back, what what's what do they think is holding them back, getting them unstuck. Um, because I think financial advice is definitely a combination of helping people make, make most of the money. But a lot of the clients have enough money that they're not necessarily comfortable or confident because they, you know, it's never enough. You can argue there's never enough. You can never feel secure, right? So, it's, but so, but just digging in a bit deeper, you can work with a client. He's got plenty of money, plenty of assets, and they still end up with plenty of money and plenty of assets. But they end up in a much better headspace. So, I had this great client a few years came in, and she had. You know, five to ten million dollars of commercial property. You know, so it all sounds pretty good. No debt. You know, plenty of money rolling in, good yields, everything. Um, but her number one goal was to um, paint. So she was really an artist in her mind. She was an artist um, who'd like been left some of these properties, and I can't remember the exact situation now. It was a while ago, but you know, and she wanted to. You know, and then she built them up and she was successful and stuff. But that was all, in her words, kind of using, you know, one part of her brain and she couldn't paint. She couldn't do what she really loved, even though she had lots of money. So she wanted somebody to come in and sort of project manage that, look after it. Not to be completely hands off, but just somebody to sort of share that burden or take a lot of that on. So that she, you know, she was in the late 60s, early 70s, she could go back yes. and paint. So for some people that might be read a book or learn a language or travel or play with the grandkids, whatever it might be. But it's just very powerful in terms of what what is the value for clients. And, you know, they will tell you if you ask them. And I think it's our job to work out what is that value, you know, and how that fits in with being a financial planner and improving their position. Do you have any go to questions when you're trying to when you're trying to you know, go down a level, down a level and down a level in terms of the, the depth of that conversation? Do, do you have any go to questions that you that you have with clients? Not particularly, but I think it's um, yeah, it's this concept of follow the emotional trail. So if somebody's talking about like the grandkids and then their investment property, well, you know, and they're blurting it all out at the same time. Okay. What are you asking about? You're asking about the investment property, you're asking about the grandkids. So whatever's got the greatest emotional trail, or you ask about that first so that you can understand what's actually important to them and it's probably going to be the grandkids rather than the investment property. Yeah. In the same way, if somebody mentions their health, you know, or relationship or a strange relationship with their child, that's, you know, for practical reasons, as well as every other reason, it's really important just to ask about that. And I think most people want to tell you if you if you ask the right questions. And I think there is definitely a connection between sort of the uh, good clients to work with generally are probably... Uh, emotionally intelligent and and other things that they're just people you like to work with and they relate to you, you relate to them. Um, and, yeah, I mean, different people, obviously, as we all know, work better with different people, different advisors, but when you sort of find the right fit, then those conversations are generally quite easy to have. And people, it, it you know, it can, it can be a burden. So people do actually want to talk about it and they're not talking to you about it. I mean, who are they talking to? They're not generally speaking talking to their accountants. They're mortgage hmm. brokers, they're doctors, necessarily, you know, but they will tell in you know, their financial planner often. Yeah, in, in my experience, yeah, if you if you ask the right questions, they'll they'll start to open up about those kind of things. You know, there's some clients where they just the way the conversation ends up going. There's there's things that they'll say, oh, you know, I've never I haven't even spoken to people in my family about these particular problems or whatever else might be going on in on in their life. If you yeah, as you said, you follow that emotional trail and. Uh, ask the right questions, I'll really start to open up. Well, I was just going to say, and I do think we're in the French planning industry still like the early adoption phase for these sorts of go deep kind of ways of thinking about it. It's not the norm. Most people are used to that sort of product advice or investment advice or whatever. So yeah, I think to advisors who are doing that, then they definitely need to be aware of that and position it in a way and, you know, explain to the client why you're doing it, why is it important and just link it into, you know, their financial well-being. 
Yeah, got it. Now, if we go back to starting a business uh, again, Andy. so you you start with a blank piece of paper. You mentioned you had to come up with a name, and it was really that somewhat pressuring you quickly. We've got to register this and, and whatever else. What what's involved in starting a business from from scratch? What what do you need? Talk talk us through what you need to start a financial planning business from that, scratch. It's a good question. I'm trying to think now. Um, look, there's definitely things you need and things that you want. I mean, obviously, in terms of need, then, um, you know, being licensed is, is the obvious one. Um, so, I don't know, I can talk about that a bit, bit more in depth, but I just wanted to find sort of a good fit for, you know, where I was at. And so, when Shark True Wealth, um, so I've had a good experience with them with Rob, Rob Coyle. Yep. Yeah, they, they you know made me feel like I could have a home with them. Rob came to you know visit me. He's basically in Newcastle. Came to um, Adelaide to Largs Bay where I live, and you know came to the local uh, cafe and sit down and had a coffee. Yeah, and they were just yeah. I suppose once you've been with a big dealer group, you're probably looking for a more personal approach. Yeah, but yeah, it's definitely. Uh, but it's also a massive challenge nowadays. I mean, back in the day, you'd started, you work for somebody, you get a split of revenue, or whatever, and off you go. But nowadays, with a fixed licensing fee, it's definitely a massive, um, you know, barrier for people to start up a new practice. So as we all know, it's going to be at least fifteen grand, if not twenty-five grand, to be licensed. Yep. So you know, that's a big hit for a startup practice. I know some dealer groups are. Cut you a little deal and waive some of the fees and stuff, so that can certainly help. But yeah, it's definitely um, a big hit. PRD cover as well. So Shard Two was good because I think it's like two percent of revenue. But some of them got a minimum. Oh, you know, come on, the minimum was worth five, ten grand, or whatever it is. So if you, again, if you start out, you know, minimum PRD cover is going to be difficult. Yeah, yeah, right. And then this time, I think what else? I suppose it's drifting into the like to have or the need to have the sort of you know. Website type of thing, LinkedIn profile, those yeah. sorts of things. So I, I mean, I just did mine myself pretty much just to get up and running, um, just to keep the cost down. Just using a template for the website, shoot up the LinkedIn profile, yeah. that sort of thing. Um, and then I think in the want to have, so like office or home, I think that's a big sort of question for people. Um, so I started off at home for about a month and then ended up getting sort of an office, sort of more like a sort of serviced office, but just had access to boardroom and a private office sort yep. of close to home. And that was quite good because people then had the option, okay, we've got an office you come into, so it makes you sound a bit more established. And if people want to come in, they can. Okay. Um, or, you know, Zoom online um, for people that, you know, not close to or don't want to travel or whatever. So, yeah, so I think, yeah, that's, I think that's, Difficult because you know again it's just an extra cost and you're just not sure how important or not it is in what you're doing really. Yep. And what about uh, like services and technology? You know, X Plan, Calendly. Like, what do you, what have you, have you yeah, yeah. got into using any of that type of type of services to try and make make your life a little bit easier, a little bit more well, efficient? Yeah, so I think but uh, as a general comment, I think a lot of it, a lot of advisors I spoke to that set up at the same time, or people online and setting up recently, the choice of dealer group and CRM is obviously pretty close. So a lot of people don't want to use X Plan. I'm just talking yep. generally. Yeah, so they're favouring dealer groups that are using Dash Advice Intelligence, etc. Because otherwise you're just stuck in with you know X Plan, and if if people want to escape from it, so. So yeah. Shard, Shard True, we're using Expand, but go into advice intelligence. So for me, that was good. My yep. challenge was I've never used Xplan, so I didn't want to learn Xplan and then advice intelligence. So I went straight on to advice intelligence, which was good. Yeah. Um, my other challenge was I was never really used to using the CRM massively. At AMP, we had Coin. Coin was considered a weakness rather than a strength for AMP. Um, and I, you know, I had I was lucky to have staff that didn't have to deal with the CRM. So um, advice intelligence. So we've just been using it as a CRM and yeah. sort of basic marketing platform. Um, I've just been using sort of free versions of most things. Um, uh, Calendarly, it's obviously quite a good one. So, yeah. but I think I'm at a stage where we don't get a lot of people just sort of book into your calendar. Yeah, um, if that's the name. Brand rec yep. recognition. So most of mine are talking, you know, talking to somebody else and he's ringing me up. I'm just booking them in. Yeah. Traditional. We don't have a whole heap of reviews and all that sort of stuff that we need. It's a really well oiled machine. 
Yeah. And then in terms of marketing initiatives, like what are you doing to, you know, the, the clients that you that, that are coming to you, where, where do they tend to be coming from? What are you doing to, to try and find them? Yeah, look, I think it's, you know, I've done a lot of stuff in this space, but when you're the client, it's always more difficult. Uh, you're your own worst client, I think, sometimes. So I just try to sort of go for a sort of a broad, like a mixed approach. So face-to-face meetings with people who might have influence or be introducers, um, and then targeting um, yeah the, the usual suspect for sort of introducers. So lo- well, locally here, we've got quite a well-defined area. We're sort of at the CPD, by seven or eight, excuse me, clicks. So yep. just targeting local people. And that's just taken a while to build up those relationships because, yeah, because I was up in the territory for seven years and out of advice. So, yeah, so that was just the approach just to get to know them and just trying to find what you do and how you do it. Um, but I think definitely takes a bit of time doing, um, and then obviously sort of LinkedIn approach. I haven't really done any Facebook marketing stuff. Yep. Um, you gave me an excellent suggestion for TikTok, which I haven't yeah. really done yet, but I did appreciate it anyway, and it's still on my list. Yep. Um, so yeah, I don't think anything sort of super, you know, super groundbreaking, um, at Shaw through the specialised in UK pension. So as a, as a dealer group, we've got a sort of big strength in that. And honestly, my background's in UK pensions and being qualified in the UK and stuff. So, um, and so at dealer group level, there's marketing efforts and, um, uh, connections, um, which yeah. is one of the readings I joined Shaw through. I was just talking to someone yesterday that had, that had reached out to speak with me and uh, this guy spent a lot of time, uh, well, most of his working life, his Aussie but most, spent most of his working life in the UK. He's only more recently come back to Australia and he was talking about his UK pension and top up or something and I and I saw something that you put on LinkedIn. I'm like, oh, no, just the guy you've got to talk to. So I was telling him he needs to, uh, he needs to reach out to you. He was talking about transfer putting some money into his state pension or something or other to maximize the payment and I said like I um, have no idea what you're talking about I'm not the person to talk to <laughs> Lucian's the yeah. guy that I know to have a chat What's with that? about that type of stuff all right um look Lucian thanks for thanks for joining me today um good to have a chat good to catch up and we'll turn it into a podcast anyway um so thank thanks for joining good luck with the new business uh, if anyone wants to find you, ask you how you're going, catch up with where you're at, where can there's LinkedIn, people can find you. What's your website? Uh, emuwealth.com. So, nice yeah, and simple. Look, I'm, I've always made an effort to chat to advisors and, you know, get ideas from them and, and share ideas with them. Um, and, yeah, look, thank, thanks for having me on, James. It's great. You're a perfect host uh, for the podcast. you got this beautiful gentle one assuming yet knowledgeable and uh, a way of making people feel welcome and, and talking with them and I love your LinkedIn videos and your TikToks and Thanks, everything Lucian. so you know you're the perfect person to host this and it's been a, yeah it's been great to be on I appreciate it thank you for joining me